Hello and welcome to this week's Isaiah Bible Study Preview. This week we're covering chapters 50, 51, and the first 12 verses of chapter 52. And we have some really amazing things to talk about today. Uh, we've mentioned before that God, in the book of Isaiah, seamlessly weaves together law, his warnings about this is what's going to happen because of you know what you've done to me as, as your God, even though I've been so loving and faithful to you. He weaves those together with these beautiful gospel promises. So you, you have those two together, this powerful God who's crying out to these people who so desperately need him. He's saying, stop what you're doing. You need to come back. I'm warning you, here's all the bad stuff that's going to happen. And then the very next sentence will say, say, this is how much I love you. This is what I'm going to do to take care of you. And our, probably the centerpiece of our, our study today is um, some pictures we get of the Messiah, the servant, as he's called here in chapter 50. So we'll, we'll look at that. The picture next to me here is from the end of chapter 50. Uh, is God just basically says there's there's two ways to approach your life. You're either in, in the palm of his hand, and, and this artist here is, is portraying the, the wounds of, in Jesus' hand. You're either in God's hand and um, trusting Jesus as your Savior and, and holding on to your relationship with God through faith, or you're lighting your fires and living wildly and, and not caring so much about God. So right in the heart of chapters 50 to 52, it, God says, here's exactly what Jesus is going to do. Now, what do you think? Are you with me or are you not? And, and as a Bible reader, the choice becomes pretty clear. The introductory activity on the top of the first page, describe the emotion you might associate with the following moments. I'm not, I'm, I'm very thankful for dentist, I should say, but I am not a huge fan of going to the dentist. I guess probably nobody is. But I, I really, uh, it's not a fun experience for me. So that moment when the dentist says, we're just about done, that makes me very happy. I, I know that you know there's still some work to be done yet that is uncomfortable or painful or whatever else, but we're almost there. We're, and the end is just around the corner. Next one, the pilot says we're approaching our destination. Uh, air travel is pretty amazing too, what a gift from God that we can travel by airplane. Uh, but it's not always the most comfortable thing, is it? To, to sit in a plane seat here, this woman has her guy next to her is, is fell asleep on her shoulder, which I don't know if you've ever had that happen. That's a little weird. So th to know that we're almost to our destination, you know, this this is a great experience in many ways to find a plane, but you, you get on the plane because you want to go somewhere. So we're almost to that destination. We're not quite there. We're almost there. Third one, your fever breaks after a long illness. Um, we're coming off winter i'm guessing watching this you you caught at least some cold or maybe you tested positive for covid and maybe you had symptoms and, and just uh how nasty that can feel in your body and that takes a toll on you mentally too emotionally perhaps and then when you're not quite better but you're turning the corner and you just feel like okay i i think i think we've reached the worst part and, and everything is going to be better from here so we're not out of the woods yet but I can tell that the end of this sickness is in sight. And then the last one, the server at the restaurant says your food is just about ready. You know, especially as a kid. You think when you're a kid waiting for the food and you're seeing, you know, food being delivered to other tables. And sometimes, you know, you ordered before the other table and you think, but wait, what's the deal? This isn't fair. So when the waiter stops by and, and says, hey, you know, we're going to bring your food out in just a second. It's like the wait isn't over, but the end is in sight. Those emotions there, I, I think, are are easy to see in, in chapters 50 to 52. God is saying, don't worry. The really good stuff is coming. The, the end of your suffering is approaching, but it, it's not there yet. There's still some tough things that you have to go through, but I'm going to send my son, the servant, and he's going to do amazing things for you. He's going to bring you home to heaven. So the almost but not yet aspect of God's promise is our first objective for this lesson. Explore the almost but not yet aspect of God's promises that God says. He's just holding things out in front of us and saying, you're going to get there. It's going to be so much better, but you got to wait. You got to endure a little bit. And so much of our life on earth is that. We're looking forward to heaven. But here's pretty good still. We live in a sinful, broken world and we're sinful people, but it's also full of God's blessings. So we can endure now. Some hard things here on this earth, but we know heaven is waiting. And then the second bullet point there, be able to explain the suffering servant concepts in this section. That is something we'll spend a lot of time focusing on on Thursday night and Sunday morning. Just a, an overview, we won't go through every everything bit by bit here in this video, but just an overview of what we'll be talking about. So the first section is titled Israel's Sin and the Servant's Obedience. 
one of the interesting ways that God starts this chapter is basically to say, whose fault is it that this is happening? He has a picture of a divorce certificate of uh, a parent selling children into slavery because they can't pay their debts. So it's this very intense situation. And it's God's way of saying, you don't see me doing that. I, I didn't divorce you. I didn't sell you into slavery because I, I'm in debt. I, I'm God. I don't get into debts. And he says, I'm the one that dried up the Red Sea. So sort of cutting off the idea that Israel is going to go into exile because of something bad God did or because he's not powerful to save them. He's basically saying this, what's happening here, what's going to happen to you, it's it's your fault. And I'm telling you that because I love you. I'm not telling you that to rub it in and be like, you guys are so bad, haha. But he's he wants them to know, like, I... I'm doing this because I love you. I'm allowing this because I love you. And that's a difficult concept when you're you know, receiving the, the consequences of your actions. But I think as, as adults, we also understand sometimes people allow consequences to happen in your life because they really love you and care about you. And they want you to learn a lesson. And it's not their fault. You know, it's not their fault that they're allowing this thing to happen to you. But it's, they do it because they love you. And it's painful and uncomfortable for them. God starts off the chapter that way, just saying, bad things are going to happen. It, this is on you, guys. And then so right from that kind of hard truth to hear, <coughs> excuse me, we go into the this, this servant. And so many of the images here make us think of Holy Week and Good Friday especially. It's nice going through Isaiah during the season of Lent because you just see so many parallels. And the, the prophecies that Jesus directly fulfilled during his time in Jerusalem so right after that, this is your fault, you get, here's what I'm going to do about it. My servant's going to come, and I'm looking forward to going through those those prophecies with you when we go to class together. And then just that picture again, the chapter finishes with God saying, you're either with me in the palm of my hand, or you're not. And I'll tell you which one I think is good. Uh, so much of this last, I don't know, 10 chapters or so of Isaiah has been God saying, here's one way to live. Here's the way to live where you're with me, and I really feel strongly that you should choose that way. Uh, the next page, every everlasting salvation for Zion. That that chapter starts interesting too, as God uh, calls back to Abram and Sarah, Abraham and Sarah, and, and basically says, "I'm I'm the God who took care of them." And remember, they had a kid when it looked like it was impossible. They were far too old to have a kid. Abraham has a kid at 100 years old. God is saying, I, "I'm I'm that God." So your situation looks impossible, Israel, Judah. Don't worry, because I'm that God who who did that amazing miracle. And when it seemed like all hope was lost, I'm the one who, who gave them exactly what they needed. I, I'm the one who promised the Savior would be born from this line of this old man and his relatively old wife. And I did it. So I'm, I'm thinking about the past. But he also looks to the future and talks about how their nation will be restored to that of the Garden of Eden. So you have this picture of like a desert that is suddenly springing up with flowers and plants and, and goes from being very barren to being very full of life, especially plant life. And a number of times God has used that imagery in Isaiah. We see that in the Psalms too. God says, your, your heart is dry and barren and there's nothing good there, but I'm going to change it. So that, that promise appears again. Uh, Isaiah 51, 9 to 16. Uh, it starts by, it's it's Isaiah, it seems like, saying, Awake, awake, arm of the Lord, close yourself, clothe yourself with strength. So that's activity number five. We'll say, agree or disagree, it feels odd that Isaiah is telling God to wake up and clothe his arm with strength. So is that weird or not? And I think there's a good point to be made about prayer. When we address God in prayer, what what's our tone? What, what's the attitude behind it? How do we talk with God? Do we talk like Isaiah does here? The next section is is back to some hard hard realities. The cup of the Lord's wrath. God uses this image of uh, drinking a, a cup of His wrath all the way down to the dregs, and He's He's telling Israel, "You're in You're in that right now. You're suffering. You know the the consequences of of being out of bounds with Me. I'm holy, and you're unholy, and you've abandoned Me and and betrayed Me, and all these different things. So you're drinking the cup of My wrath. But it finishes with Him saying, "Now I'm going to pass that cup of wrath to your enemies." So do you see what I'm saying again about the warnings and promises? It's just you know, right when you think God is just, well, God is so mad at these people. Then he says, but here's the thing that I'm going to do. I'm going to do this amazing, loving thing for you. The last section from Isaiah 52, uh, the first 12 verses there, there's some really powerful concepts in it. Now, uh, God is telling the people of Zion, clothe yourselves with strength, put on your garments of splendor, Jerusalem, the holy city. So again, the, the promise that th things are going to be better. It's going to be a brighter day. 
verses 7 to 10, I have an activity number 9 there that we usually read those verses. It's the first lesson on Christmas Day. So as you read verses 7 through 10, ask yourselves, why do these make a very good Christmas Day Old Testament lesson? We'll talk about that, uh, time permitting, in our studies. Uh, and then it ends with this amazing promise from God. He's, he's, so again, this is before the exile to Babylon, but he's telling them the future. And he's saying, you're, you're going to go to Babylon, but I'm going to bring you back. And when you, when you go to Babylon, it's going to be chaos and destruction because you're being led there against your will. But when you come back, it's going to be calm and nice. And I'm going to have your back and I'm going to guard your front. So bad times, good times. That's so much of Isaiah. God's saying this bad thing's going to happen, but here's how it's going to turn out. And what a good reminder for us in our lives, you know, 3,000 years later, 2,500 years later, is to say, I, I know that my life isn't perfect. I'm not perfect. Things don't always go, or maybe from your perspective, rarely go the way that you want them to go. And God says, yeah, I know, but here's how it's going to turn out. Bad things good things you know you're at the dentist you're almost done you're getting off the plane you're going to the plane and get and get to your destination all those 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 pictures of ah we're almost there isaiah gives us so many reasons to, to hang on right now and say i can do this by god's strength i can hang on because i know really good stuff is coming for me and especially in heaven that's it for today uh thanks for watching and god's bless your god bless your study of isaiah thank you